Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, both our in-person participants and those of you who have chosen and are able to join us online. Uh, certainly today was a day when having the opportunity for hybrid learning, like we're trying to do more and more of here in the Faculty of Education, was certainly a valuable opportunity today uh, for those that were not able to drive in. Uh, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement and in particular to recognize and consider the essential nature of um, UBC Vancouver as the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people as a place of learning. So it is a place of learning, has been and always will be, we certainly hope, for us as well as the Musqueam people. We are their guests on their land and are really grateful to be able to do our work here um, on days like today and on and every day. Being this close to the ocean, I think many of us have uh, the ocean in our hearts and certainly the Musqueam people have had the ocean as part of their rich traditions um, and their language and their culture for many, many, many years and many more to come. So with that, I would like to introduce and ask Dr. Samson Nashon to join us. He is going to briefly, am I wrong, Samson? You're looking uncomfortable. Are you going to come up here and speak? <laughs> so Dr. Nashon is going to uh, join us and he will uh, welcome us on behalf of the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy. We'd also like to take a quick moment to thank the Edith Lando Center for Virtual Learning for funding today uh, to support not only this online event, but some snacks in person, and also some future filming and web development that Sandra, myself, and our colleague, Lindsay um, Graham will be participating. Lindsay's joining us online as well. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for those who have made this possible. Mine is just to say welcome and a thank you for the beautiful land acknowledgement. First, I must say this is the right time to talk about the environment and our responsibility. And just before I say anything, like there might be a time when Professor Boyd will talk. But I want to use this opportunity to welcome him because I want to mention something about him. First of all, Professor Boyd, David Boyd, is appointed, that is, is appointed with the School of Public Policy and the Global Affairs and the Institute for Resources, Environment, and the sustainability at this university. He is one of Canada's leading experts in environmental law and policy and internationally renowned authority on the relationship between human rights and the environmental degradation. Think about that, because he'll talk about it. He's currently Special Envoy, UN Special Representative or Repertoire on Human Rights and the Environment. He was Chair of the Vancouver, that's when we were thinking of Vancouver's, that's Green City by 2020. So think of somebody who's been engaged in all that. He's widely published. There are many books. If you look at his website, you'll be amazed. <laughs> Even me when I looked at that, I was very proud to be associated with a colleague at this university who holds our name internationally like that. So David, feel welcome to this department. We acknowledge you. My presentations, one for this position I hold as head of department and elsewhere, has always been advocate for environmental consciousness. 
That is, anything we do, whether you are teaching mathematics, whatever you are doing, have the environment in your mind. You're either destroying it, or sustaining or improving it even further. When you're growing up, the political class wanted to build a huge building in East Africa. People had never seen such wonderful buildings. But there was this woman who cried and they referred to those leaders as being satanic because they wanted to destroy the beauty of the city by bringing tall buildings. She came up with saving the planet, but from the point of where I grew up, firewood, you go there and they say, don't use firewood. You have to think of an alternative, what those mamas would use. So, she was telling them, if you cut one tree, plant four. Amazingly, that happened. Cut one tree, plant four. Amazingly, that happened. And now this has gone to a different level. So education is very important. Therefore, this particular presentation, and I call it an educating moment, where we are going to learn from each other, from those who spend their lives talking about how we can protect our environment. It's the moment. And if I look around, we all represent the globe. So if, if each one of us was to talk about it, talk about that message, there would be change. So thank you so much. And Professor David Boyd, feel welcome. And all others who are joining this, feel welcome. Thank you so much, Ivo. Thank you. Thank you. I like to start off by thinking about the big picture. And so this is an amazing photograph that was taken by the Voyager space probe about 30 years ago, uh, looking back from the outer edges of our solar system. And that tiny pale blue dot is what the astrophysicist Carl Sagan uh, described as the pale blue dot, the really the home that all of us share and cherish. This is a more recent photograph taken from only 1.4, uh, million kilometers away out by the rings of Saturn. And again, you can see that tiny blue dot. That is the planet Earth. The only planet in the solar system, in the galaxy, possibly in the universe, that is known to support life. And I think it really behooves all of us to remember that this, this blue-green planet that we're so fortunate to inhabit is the only place where life exists, to the best of our knowledge today. And there's no better uh, witnesses to that than astronauts. And on, on your left here is a, an astronaut by the name of Scott Carpenter, who went into space on Mercury 7 in 1962. And when he, he was a former Korean War veteran, but when he came back, he said, our highest loyalty should not be to our country, our religion, our hometown, or even ourselves. It should be to this planet, the only home we will ever know. And then William Anders in 1968 was one of the first astronauts to go to the moon. And what he said when he came back was, we went to all this trouble to go to the moon. And the most important thing that we learned about was the earth. Um, so, you know, wisdom from these astronauts. And then when we think about life on earth, 3.8 billion years of evolution. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing, it's mind boggling. We're very fortunate here at the University of British Columbia to have this incredible skeleton of a blue whale uh, over in the Beatty Biodiversity Museum. The largest creature that has ever lived on Earth, 
twice as large as a Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, even the calves of a blue whale are the size of a full-grown African elephant. Those calves drink 250 liters of milk a day. And the blue whale, this blue whale skeleton, if you haven't, please do go and see it. Um, there's actually, you can't see it because it's blocked out by a pillar, but there's these really two interesting bones that hang down from the sides of the tail, which are vestigial limbs from when the blue whales walked on land. I mean, <laughs> these things are just completely mind-boggling, right? Um, and can anybody tell me what this is? Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to be able to get it because this is the earwax plug <laughs> from a blue whale. And it is through science studying the earwax plugs that we know that blue whales live an average of 90 years. One has lived up to 110 years. And by studying the chemical composition of the wax of a blue whale's ear, scientists can tell you where in the ocean they were, when in the ocean they were, and really it's an expert, there are stress hormones that can be detected in this earwax plug that tell us all kinds of fascinating things about blue whales. Again, just extraordinary, the diversity of life on this planet. And of course, for those of you who are, who are young, you won't really realize, but as recently as the 1960s, the prevailing scientific understanding was that all animal species besides humans were unthinking, unfeeling automatons, essentially. They just reacted to external stimuli. And it was the groundbreaking work of the primatologist Jane Goodall, working with chimpanzees in Gombe National Park, that changed forever our perspective of other animals. Now, human beings, we share night, over 97% of our DNA with chimpanzees, but, which mo many people are aware of, but most people don't know that we actually share DNA with every other form of life on the planet, be that plant, animal, or fungi. Um, and many of these uh, other species of animals in recent years have been uh, putting humans to shame. Chimpanzees have far better short-term memory. So there's a game you can play where on the computer screen up pop the numbers from one to nine in sequence. And if you pit uh, a chimpanzee against a university professor, nine times out of 10, the chimpanzee will outperform the university professor in remembering which numbers popped up in the proper sequence. Oh, here we go, we're going. We're running out of batteries. <laughs> 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 what, <laughs> what kind of batteries do you need? <laughs> um, oh, and, and so, so, you know, chimpanzees, another, another vertebrate animal, whales, vertebrate animals, but one of my favorite animals is the octopus, because the octopus is just so strange, right? Three hearts, eight legs, nine brains, nine brains, blue, br blue blood, and an eye that is very similar physiologically to the human eye. Octopuses can recognize humans, they can do complete tasks, complex tasks. This octopus actually escaped from an aquarium in New Zealand and returns to the ocean by climbing out of its tank, finding a drain, uncapping the drain, going down the drain, and that drain led back to the ocean. Absolutely incredible. In the European Union, you can no longer do science experiments on octopuses because there's a list of vertebrate animals which you can't do scientific experiments on. And they've created the, they've designated the octopus as an honorary vertebrate because of its incredible intelligence and complexity. We used to have an expression, some of you have probably heard, bird brains. Well, we have to rethink that one. This is a Clark's nutcracker. They uh, harvest thousands of seeds in the summer and the fall. They hide those seeds in the forests of the Southern United States. And then they remember where they are. And they not only do they remember where they are, but they retrieve them in sequence to ensure that they are eating the fresh ones and not uh, letting others become stale. Next slide, please. Elephants, of course, we have incredible evidence now that elephants mourn their dead just like humans do, and that they have areas of, of which are clearly sacred to them. Um, and one of the most amazing scientific discoveries of recent years is that humpback whales will actually protect other species of marine mammals from killer whales. Killer whales and humpback whales don't get along very well. And um, there are dozens now of recorded incidents of 
humpback whales, protecting other species of whales from killer whale attacks, and even protecting seals from killer whale attacks. And there's no scientific explanation for that behavior other than altruism, doing something to protect someone else. And the, the last example I'll give of the absolute wonders of nature is that even insects can learn and can teach. This was a scientific study where they took 100 honeybees and they placed these trays of uh, plastic trays with sugar water underneath a plastic cover. The only way the bees could get at the sugar water was to pull on the cord and pull it out. Uh, they had 100 bees they did this experiment with. Two figured it out. They took those two, they added another 98 bees that hadn't done the experiment. And the second time around, over 50 of the bees figured it out. The two leaders taught the other bees how to do this. I mean, it's just, again, it's really absolutely extraordinary. Next. And so it's, it's that backdrop that I want to give you, that, that incredible sense of wonder about the living planet that we are so fortunate to share. And I'm not going to go into details about the global planetary crisis. We know there's a climate emergency. We know that there's pervasive toxic pollution. And we know that we are humans engineering the sixth mass extinction. There's more than one million species of risk of extinction. Wildlife populations in many parts of the world have declined precipitously over the last five decades. And scientists are telling us that we need to make rapid, systemic, and transformative changes in order to save this marvelous planet that we, that we live on. And at the root of the problems is the fact that for thousands of years, whether it's Christianity or Western politics, we see human beings as somehow separate from nature and superior to the rest of nature, this egocentric paradigm. And what we really need to move towards is an ecocentric paradigm which has been the case of indigenous um, cultures, indigenous legal systems around the world for literally tens of thousands of years. And so this is where I bring my human rights hat to bear because when we talk about rapid and transformative changes, one of the most powerful catalysts for those changes in recent centuries has been human rights. Think about the way that human rights were used by the abolitionists to bring about the end of slavery, the way that human rights were used by suffragettes to advance the cause of women's equality, the way that human rights were at the heart of the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, and the way that indigenous peoples in recent years have been deploying their rights to regain uh, stewardship over their traditional territories. It's been exactly 75 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was 1948 and included no mention of the environment. At the time, it simply wasn't seen as a pressing issue. Next slide, please. But in 2021, uh, at the, universe, at the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council, nations of the world voted to adopt a resolution that recognized for the first time at the global level that everyone everywhere on this planet has the right to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And last July in 2022, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a similar resolution. This right has already been found in legal systems around the world dating back to the 1970s in countries like France, Portugal, Spain, Costa Rica, and others. And where this right is recognized in law, it has really made a difference. So Costa Rica, for example, included this right in their constitution, their highest and strongest law in 1994. Since that time, the portion of forest cover in Costa Rica has doubled from less than 25% to more than 50%. They have protected 30% of their country in national parks and ecological reserves. They generate 99% of their electricity from renewable sources, geothermal, hydroelectric, solar, and wind. Costa Rica has passed laws that prohibit offshore oil and gas development, that prohibit open pit mining, and they have an incredible payment for ecosystem services program, whereby they have a carbon tax, and the government takes the revenue from that tax and then shares it with indigenous people and peasants who are in the process of restoring and reforesting their land. So Costa Rica is one of those countries that exemplifies what an enormous difference the right to a healthy environment can make. France is a more recent example. France added the right to a healthy environment to its constitution in 2004. And since that time, France has passed a series of world leading laws, becoming the first country in the world to ban fracking, hydraulic fracturing for oil and gas, the first country in the world to ban all uses of the bee-killing neonicotinoid pesticides, the first country in the global north to prohibit the manufacturing and export of pesticides to the global south that are not permitted in the European Union, 
and most recently, a law that recognizes that the people of France have the right to breathe clean air. So the right to it, the human right to a healthy environment is making a big difference, and that's really exciting. It couldn't come at a more timely time in terms of the response to the planetary environmental crisis. But I also want to talk about a kind of parallel development of law and culture, which is for hundreds of years in Western society, we have treated animals, all animals, from fish to bears to, uh, to whales, as things, as property, as no different legally than a spoon or a chair or a table. That's beginning to change because of our different, because of our new scientific understanding. So a number of countries in recent years have passed laws that change the legal status of animals from things to sentient beings, reflecting again that those scientific developments. Um, and the legal breakthroughs are happening at the level of individual animals, individual species, and ecosystems as a whole. So this is a photograph of an orangutan named Sandra who lived uh, a good chunk of her life in a zoo in Buenos Aires, Argentina, until a group of creative lawyers came up with the idea that they could use habeas corpus, one of the oldest legal doctrines in, uh, in the common law, which is used, uh, has been used for centuries to achieve the release of people who are being improperly imprisoned. And these lawyers thought, look, the definition of a person is quite elastic. We can, in, in law in Canada and the United States, many countries, a corporation has the legal status of a person, a municipality has the legal status of a person. So they thought, given what we know about the sentience of the great apes, why couldn't we use habeas corpus to argue that Sandra, the orangutan, should be freed from this small enclosure in the zoo and um, you know, it's not feasible to take her and release her in the wild, but she could be taken to a wildlife sanctuary where she would have a much higher quality of life. A court in Argentina granted that petition for habeas corporate, habeas corpus several years ago. Next slide. Please. And also a similar petition, uh, habeas cor cor corpus for a uh, chimpanzee named Sandra. And then in Colombia, next slide please, uh, the same legal tool was used to achieve uh, liberation for Chucho, a spectacled bear. So these three animals are now living not in zoos and tiny enclosures, but in wildlife sanctuaries with other members of their species. Significant improvements in their quality of life. Some countries have passed laws, as I talked about earlier, prohibiting scientific experimentation on great apes. Um, also prohibiting, the, uh, prohibiting keeping whales and dolphins in captivity. Whales and dolphins also incredibly intelligent sentient beings. And then, so that's a huge step forward in terms of our relationship with other animals. And then there's also been some amazing developments with respect to other species. So um, in the late 1960s, the United States was the first country in the world to pass a law to protect endangered species. And uh, scientists discovered this fish, this tiny fish called the snail darter in a river in Tennessee where uh, the government wanted to build a big dam on uh, the Teleco Dam. And this was the first time this snail darter had ever been discovered. So the scientists who discovered it petitioned to have the government list it as an endangered species. That petition was successful. And then when the dam was approved, uh, he worked with a professor at the law school there to file a lawsuit saying, you can't build this dam because it will damage the habitat of this endangered snail darter. The case worked its way through the American legal system, lower courts, uh, made fun of the case. In fact, the, the Court of Appeals actually wrote a poem about the snail dugger in its judgment, just kind of ridiculing this. But the Supreme Court of the United States said that the U.S. Congress, in passing the Endangered Species Act, had made a clear commitment to preventing the extinction of other species, no matter what the cost. An incredible thing for a court to say, no matter what the cost, we have to protect other species. And there have been similar judgments around the world. This is an Asiatic buffalo, next one please, and an Asiatic lion. The Supreme Court of India has made judgments in cases involving these two endangered species, saying that these species, as part of the diversity of life on Earth, have the same rights to live and exist as human beings. They don't have human rights, but they have lion's rights and buffalo's rights. So, Incredible developments at the individual animal level, the species level, and then at the ecosystem level. Can anybody guess who this gentleman is? This is Walt Disney. Walt Disney, not only a movie-making mogul, 
but also a would-be ski development mogul. Uh, he wanted to build a ski resort in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains of California in a beautiful remote valley called, valley called Mineral King. And the United States government approved the permits and was sued. One of the first environmental lawsuits in the U.S. was sued by the Sierra Club. Well, the court said, who is the Sierra Club? They don't have, they're not being harmed by this. And the, the basic rules of uh, a law in the United States and many common law countries is you have to be personally harmed in order to have what's called standing to sue. And so the Sierra Club appealed and appealed it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And while that appeal was pending, a law professor at the University of California named Christopher Stone wrote an article, a very provocative article called Should Trees Have Standing? And that article argued that, you know, if corporations and municipalities can have standing to sue, why not trees? Why not woodpeckers? Why not the Mineral King Valley? One of the Supreme Court judges, Justice William O. Douglas, actually read that law review article and wrote a, wrote a, wrote a judgment that said, yeah, it, the Mineral King Valley and the Sierra Club should have standing to sue. Nature should have the ability to bring, obviously humans would have to represent nature, but nature should have the ability to bring lawsuits. Unfortunately, the majority of the United States Supreme Court did not agree with Justice Douglas. And so this idea of rights of nature kind of fell into, uh, fell into a, a, a sort of a deep sleep for a period of decades. Um, but then it came back again. In 2006, a small community in, oh, this is the, this is the Mineral King Valley, sorry. Um, we can keep going. One more, yeah. A small community in Pennsylvania uh, passed a municipal bylaw recognizing the rights of nature. They were concerned about a proposal to spread sewage sludge on farmland around their community. And they thought by recognizing the rights of nature, they might have a chance to defeat it. They were unable to do with conventional environmental law. And that kind of kicked off this rights of nature movement in the US, which spread to um, Santa Monica, California, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there are now more than four dozen municipalities in the United States that have rights of nature bylaws. But it was really 2008 that this rights of nature idea really took hold in the constitution of Ecuador. I, as I mentioned earlier, a constitution is from a legal perspective, the highest and strongest law of a country, but also culturally reflects, uh, reflects a nation's deepest values and aspirations. So Ecuador, because of uh, the influence of indigenous people in Ecuador, Ecuador drafted a new constitution that has five really poetic provisions related to the rights of Mother Earth, the rights of Pachamama. And that was 2008. Since that time, Ecuador has changed more than 70 laws, regulations, and policies to bring in the rights of nature. So the rights of nature are now found in the criminal code of Ecuador, for example. Uh, next slide, please. And the rights of nature have been defended in court. So there was a highway project that was um, where waste rock was being dumped into this river, the Vilcabamba River. Two local residents brought a, brought a lawsuit arguing that this highway construction was violating the constitutional rights of the Vilcabamba River. Um, and the court agreed with those two citizens, ordered the company to stop that project, to repair the damage they had done, and to post signage apologizing to the, to the Vilcabamba River for violating its constitutional <laughs> rights. Uh, that was followed rapidly by, in 2010, by Bolivia passing a law on the rights of Mother Earth. And this, uh, trend has continued to spread. So you're seeing uh, there was a law passed recently in Uganda. There have been developments in Mexico, India, Bangladesh, and throughout Latin America regarding the rights of mother nature. But I think from a Canadian perspective, the most interesting comparison is New Zealand. New Zealand, a country like Canada with a long history of colonial oppression of indigenous people, New Zealand also kind of a pioneer in human rights. The first country to uh, recognize the right of women to vote was New Zealand. And in 2012, as a part of the ongoing reconciliation between the government of New Zealand and the indigenous Maori people, the government agreed to recognize the rights of the Whanganui River. And in doing so, created a guardian that's comprised of a majority of Maori representatives and a minority of government representatives, whose task it is to represent and to defend the rights of the Fonganui River. Next slide, please. That was followed quickly by a law passed in 2014 called the Te Uruera Act of 2014, a piece of government legislation in New Zealand 
that takes this area, which is an area of about 250,000 hectares of lakes and forests and mountains that was previously designated as a national park. That national park had been uh, created without the consent or the, even the consultation with the Maori, so it was really Maori land taken from them unlawfully. And what the Te Urawera Act does is it designates Te Urawera, it takes away the national park designation, and it designates Te Urawera as a legal person. And then it took the Crown's title, their ownership of that land, and transferred it to the legal person. So in other words, this ecosystem of Te Urawera now owns it itself, nature owning itself. It's such a radical concept from a Western legal perspective. And if you look at the planet Earth, 99.999% of the land surface of this planet is owned by one single species, Homo sapiens. It's really a, an enormous act of hubris to think that one species among millions should own the whole lot, lock, stock, and barrel. Excellent. So now processes continue in New Zealand. This is Mount Taranaki, a, pl a place of sacred spiritual value to the Maori. The process of drafting a law to recognize the rights of Mount Taranaki is underway. And this idea continues, as I mentioned, to spread like wildfire. This is the Atrato River in Colombia in South America, uh, the subject of a decision by the Constitutional Court of Colombia that this river, which is threatened by um, illegal mining, has rights and that the government must protect the rights of the Atrato River. That decision has been followed by 10 other decisions in Colombia on the rights of nature, including an amazing case that was brought by 25 children and teenagers arguing that deforestation in the Amazon uh, rainforest, part of which is in Colombia, violated their constitutional right to health environment. And in that case, the Supreme Court of Colombia said, yes, you are absolutely right. Deforestation, because of its contribution to biodiversity loss and the climate crisis, violates your right to a healthy environment, but it also violates the rights of the Amazon rainforest. So, um, you know, making these two things, these two ideas, the kind of anthropocentric idea of a human right to a healthy environment and the rights of nature, bringing them together in a very synergistic way. Um, and this is the Magpie River in Quebec, which is the first place in Canada where the rights of nature have been recognized in a really interesting uh, joint decision by a First Nations community uh, living in the watershed of the Magpie River and a local municipal government. So the municipal government passed a bylaw, uh, the First Nation passed a resolution, and they both recognized the rights of the Magpie River. And that brings us back home to the west coast of British Columbia, where we live in uh, close proximity to these incredible southern resident killer whales one of the most endangered species in Canada and the world, um, partly because a huge chunk of their population was stolen in the 1960s for sale to aquariums around the world, and now continuing to struggle because of difficulties with access to food, ocean noise, and pollution. And there are efforts underway to uh, achieve the recognition of the rights of the southern resident killer whales. And people ask me, well, what difference would that make? And my answer is, look, if those southern resident killer whales have rights, then we have responsibilities. We have to ensure that some share of the Chinook salmon fishery is reallocated from co commercial fishermen to southern resident killer whales. We have to stop um, dumping persistent bioaccumulative toxic substances into the ocean. And we have to stop improving things like pipelines and port expansions that increase the noise that's already um, causing problems for the southern resident killer whales. And the, the thing that's really important to remember here is that if we stop the actions that are harming these species, nature is incredibly resilient. It can bounce back. These are, this, is a, this is a mother humpback whale and her calf. Humpback whales globally were below, their population was reduced by whaling to fewer than 10,000 individuals. But whaling stopped, commercial whaling stopped in the 1960s. There's now more than 80,000 humpbacks swimming in the world's oceans, a terrific recovery. And on, I live on Pender Island uh, off the coast of Vancouver, and I've been living there for seven years, from 2000 to 2007. Saw lots of Southern resident killer whales, but had never seen a humpback whale. And in 2007, saw a humpback whale. And every year since, I've seen more humpback whales. There's now 1,500 humpback whales in, uh, that 
spend time in British Columbia waters on a yearly basis. Next slide, please. And a similar story with gray whales. Gray whales in the um, Northeast Pacific were reduced to fewer than 2,000 individuals in that population in the 1960s. There's no, now more than 20,000. And if you ever get the chance to go to Baja, California, there's a small fishing village on the San Ignacio Lagoon where you can go out with a, during the fisheries off season, you can go out in a little putt putt boat with a fisherman. They'll turn off the engine five, five minutes from shore, turn off the engine and these incredible gray whales that are just curious will swim up to the boat and kind of like bump their head against the side of the boat very gently. This one is a, this one is a mother, um, as you can tell by all the barnacles on her head. But when I was there, there was also a baby that came up to our boat uh, with absolutely the, the most smooth. I mean, you imagine a human baby with that beautiful, soft, smooth skin. I wouldn't say this baby gray whale skin was soft, but it was incredibly smooth. And it was honestly one of the most electrifying experiences of my life. I didn't really feel at first like I should touch the whale, but it was so clear from its behavior that it wanted to have this interaction that, that I broke down and then I broke down and cried after that. So next slide, please. Um, I want to just conclude by talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is a blueprint for the future that we all want. A future without poverty, a future without hunger, a future where everyone has access to healthcare and education. And these goals replaced the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. I'm sorry to say that we're not on track to achieve the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I really believe it's because of a fundamental misunderstanding that politicians around the world think these are just aspirations. Next slide, please. But in a recent report that I did for the United Nations General Assembly, I took each of those sustainable development goals and identified, it, identified their basis in human rights law. And each of the 17 sustainable development goals has a rock solid foundation in international human rights law, which means that these are not aspirations or options. These are obligations. And so I'm um, working with a number of governments now to try and ad advance that understanding which is really revolutionary in terms of what governments would have to do to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and the, the reality is that, you know, we started this talk with pictures taken from millions or billions of kilometers from the Earth. Human beings have extraordinary ingenuity. One of the most amazing projects that I've learned about in my work with the United Nations is the Great Green Wall of Africa. How many people here have heard of the Great Green Wall? Literally nobody. This is one of the most extraordinary undertakings of the 21st century. Billions of dollars are being invested, mostly uh, donated by the European Union, uh, to, a, to a project that spans the entire continent of Africa, from Senegal on the west coast to Somalia on the east coast. And what they're doing is they're planting hundreds of millions, they already planted hundreds of millions of trees. They will plant billions of trees. They are restoring degraded agricultural land they are revitalizing traditional agricultural techniques. They are um, bringing solar electricity to villages that never had any access to electricity. They are in the process addressing the climate crisis, restoring biodiversity, reducing hunger, um, and reducing food insecurity, providing employment opportunities. It's just the most incredible project and strikingly few people have heard about this. It's a project that addresses 14 of the 17 sustainable development goals, all in one project. Um, so I encourage people to learn more about that. And the last thing I want to say, which connects to the sustainable development goals, is we're all aware of these international treaties like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, the Convention on Biodiversity. And people really don't understand the problem with those international environmental treaties, which are legally binding on the countries like Canada that have ratified them, they don't have any mechanisms for accountability or enforcement. So Canada can make commitments, set targets, as we have done since 1992, and repeatedly miss those targets. In fact, Canada has never met one of its climate change targets. But when you bring human rights into the equation, human rights provide processes, institutions, and opportunities for holding governments accountable. It's happening like crazy in terms of climate change, beginning with the decision of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands about five years ago, where the Supreme Court of the Netherlands 
found that the Dutch government was violating the human rights of its citizens by not reducing greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said needed to happen. That's been followed by cases in Germany, in France, in Belgium, in Colombia, and all over the world where courts are forcing governments to take more ambitious climate action, which they couldn't do on the basis of the Paris Agreement, but they can do based on human rights. So that's why I'm really excited about human rights. But also, just to close, um, we need to stop thinking about nature as a commodity that's there for humans to exploit and start thinking of nature as this extraordinary community to which we belong. And sharing is a big part of that. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, good. Looking forward to your questions and our conversation. Educators who are going to share a little bit briefly about uh, how they are engaging their students, uh, whether that be post-secondary students. Uh, Doug Adler is one of our uh, panelists today. We also have Kristen Vischer, who's a grade seven teacher in the Delta School District, and someone I will always remember as the song master. <laughs> she can make a song about any process <laughs> that is natural in the world and make it meaningful Aww. for students. And then we also have joining us uh, Laura McKillop, a grade two teacher from White Rock Elementary out in South Surrey, who's been doing some really interesting uh, projects related not only to the environment and the oceans, but related to the UN Sustainability Goals and, and climate action in a way as well. So we've invited them to uh, speak a little bit right now. So I think we'll begin, Sandra. I just wanted to mention, of course, our wonderful graduate student, Jiresh, is also joining us. Uh, oh, wonderful. I'm panel. sorry, I wasn't so, aware. Sure. <laughs> sorry, Yvonne, I didn't, I didn't let you know. Okay, Jiresh is... <laughs> We are an emergent here. experience here yeah. today, so we're great to thank, thank you. So, Laura, we'll turn it over to you, and I believe you have the ability. You've got a couple of slides, um, and you can go ahead and share screen. So, I'm a teacher at White Rock Elementary, um, <laughs> and have been for a while, and I'll just sort of jump right in. Um, this is This is my dad. So my dad is a mechanic, and if you ask my dad, he'll tell you that cars are a system made up of connected parts, parts that work together, and he knows cars. He knows cars so well, he can tell by listening what's wrong. He can track down any problem, um, and he knows how to troubleshoot if it's a problem he's never seen before or there's not a procedure for. He can figure it out. So he knows how to take care of cars. He's take, he took care of, he had a Honda Civic from 1986 and he took, he made it live for like 20 years and we all gave him a hard time about it because he didn't want to ever let it go. But bottom line, he knows how to take care of cars. So if I have a problem with my car, I, I call him. I know in the meantime, I can take a bus, I can carpool, I can walk and I can let him figure out what to do. He'll tell me the problem, he'll tell me how to fix it, he'll force all the parts, and he'll give me advice for what to do next time. And I'll either heed that advice, um, and my life will go on, and I'll reach out the next time I have a car problem, or I won't listen to his advice, because I'll forget, and there'll be a bigger inconvenience and a bigger cost to me. Um, I might have other problems with connected parts that might come up. My whole car might break down. It might break down and it might impact traffic patterns. It might be on a bridge. It might frustrate other people. And certainly it will frustrate my dad. But still, if it's my car and that happens, worst case scenario, life will still go on. At the end of the day, though, I would probably take better care of my car if I was a mechanic like my dad. But I'm not one. I don't really, the, well, the reasons why are I don't really care about cars. I'm not paid to do it. And ultimately, I know I can call my dad. He's the expert. He can fix it. And whatever consequence there is, I can clean up. I can get work around. So when it comes to cars and those systems, it's a little bit of ignorance is bliss. Or maybe ignorance is just sort of a neutral place to be. But when it comes to the natural world, I feel a little differently. So our environments, our oceans, they're their own kinds of complex interconnected groups of systems. 
Um, why I care about them, why I feel differently, isn't because I'm paid to. It's not because there's experts I can defer to. Um, it's because I love the natural world. I appreciate it. And even if I didn't, there's ultimately no new world to buy. It's not like a car where I can just work around it once I've destroyed it. <laughs> Um, and beyond that, there's ethical considerations that are different than a car system. A car is made up of parts, inanimate parts, um, parts that work together but are not living parts. When it comes to our natural world, we're dealing with living, sim living systems, living parts that are interconnected. Human and human um, living parts, including me. I'm not separate from this system. I'm a part of it and I'm not the driver of the car that turns it off. I'm just as embedded in the system as everything else. So if the car dies, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm dying with it because if one part of the system breaks down, we know that related things break down. Food webs collapse, climate change, habitats, and as an educator, I, I this matters to me. And as a human, it matters to me. But to focus on that sort of outlook is pretty overwhelming, especially if you're dealing with seven-year-olds. So that leads me to the teaching philosophy I've sort of ended up adopting. There is the salmon. Um, and it's a philosophy of teaching, trying to teach kids how the system works, what connects to what giving them the tools and the training to be like my dad, to be mechanics who care about this system because they do, they have a right. We all have a right to this healthy environment, but as part of that, there's a built in responsibility to be a part of that system and to help it run smoothly, doing little or no harm as I see it. So when it comes to working with kids, it's not just about knowing what's broken or blaming people. It's about, learning the parts, learning the connections, seeing their significance, seeing the breakdowns, being able to minimize negative impact. And the really exciting thing with kids is being able to troubleshoot solutions, to, to be mechanics who are actively involved in fixing the problems or mitigating. And like my dad, when it comes to being a mechanic, trying to help and teach other drivers how to take better care. And with kids, it's teaching others what you've learned. So another difference um, that I think about when I think about the living system is that I think about the need to consider and acknowledge the rights of the non-human parts of it. Um, like was just talked about really well, the orcas, the wolves, the salmon. There's a different ethical level than a car system there. That if I'm embedded, there's an equality there in terms of their the rights. And as a teacher, I know that that makes me care more, but I can't force kids to care, but I can invite them to explore. I can invite them to be curious. I can invite them to see how the natural systems work and how they connect so that they can see and experience for themselves and start to care. So teaching to basically prevent them from being ignorant to it. Because when you understand how something works and why keeping it working matters, you can self-regulate, you can monitor to help keep it working and help problem solve um, in the event that it doesn't. So for how I got here <laughs> with this sort of teaching philosophy is when I got hired at White Rock Elementary, I became the literal and metaphorical mechanic for a sequarium that was already full of local intertidal creatures. So basically a mini ocean ecosystem, which is extremely humbling and at times very stressful, <laughs> but also very <laughs> joyful. And at first I was overwhelmed and I focused on the parts of that system, that living system. So learning and teaching about decorator crabs, limpets, chitons, nudibranchs, all the different things. And then the worst possible thing from my perspective that could have happened happened and our chiller broke. So essentially the ocean ecosystem broke <laughs> and I didn't know how it worked. <laughs> so. The living creatures that I cared about and that the kids cared about, um, they were their health was at stake. And there's all sorts of issues with the fact that they're in captivity to begin with, but they have a right to be taken care of and to have a healthy environment when they're in there. And there's an ethical consideration there that I couldn't help but feel. So I had to figure out what the connections were to fix the problem, to find out why the chiller not working mattered um, while the actual mechanics fixed the chiller. 
So we had to figure out how to do workarounds. We had to figure out why it was important. And then of course that the kids are curious, so they wanted to know too. And as I learned, I tried to teach it the best I could to the kids. So we would do um, work in the dance studio. We did work uh, independently in the classroom. We had discussions. We did all sorts of activities around the currents, around respiration, oxygen, climate change, plankton. So basically learning what parts of the ecosystem um, our chiller, our bubbler, our pump, what parts they play and why the breakdown is a problem and what we're doing to try to solve the problem for now. And then as I taught it, I understood it better and why not give the kids the same opportunity to share their learning because to teach it to a friend is usually the best way to learn it for yourself to reinforce it. So that led to doing things that looked more outward. So around our sequarium, we did a display where we talked about what the currents are, um, why, and little ducks around the school um, to bring people to that display, to explain the global conveyor belt, to explain, um, this was after the sequarium was back up and running, to explain why the breakdown was a problem. Um, collaborative work where we would share our learning with the wider school community. And the buy-in, the kids got really excited about this, really engaged. And again, it, it was learning that system rather than just focusing on a part of that system. So that, those are just close-ups. Um, and also, and so then what that led into was exploring things like the marine food web. Um, and how different things relate. And as we went into these kinds of projects, now the focus is more on having the kids share their learning with each other and with the wider school community. So when we learned about the Marine Food Web, for example, we did all kinds of things as a class. We played a tag game that we kept changing the rules for um, and experimenting with. We did the bulletin board displays. Then the kids wrote scripts and then they made a play and we made costumes and we explained the roles and the connections between things. And that led to exploring things like plankton. So exploring plankton, we did scavenger hunts that were more interactive with the wider school community and hid little pieces of kid drawn plankton around the, the school and had it get returned. Um, and then that was so successful and so exciting for the kids that we worked together with another class to do a fundraiser where we thought about the connection between um, plankton and microplastics and then the resident orca whales and the relationship between the Chinook salmon as well. And kids designed their own um, planktonic prints and we sold them along with um, tote bags and did lots of educational work around it. And the most exciting part, of course, was seeing the kids share that learning out with the wider community. Um, so there's uh, some of our plank totes, we called them. They're all made up of plankton. And it was just a really nice way for them to understand and share their understanding of how the microscopic, even the most microscopic things, have such a macroscopic impact on the bigger system and how it all comes back together. Um, this is just from our fundraiser and they really took pride in it and I think that they the hope is that they remember it and that they take that learning forward and remember those teeny tiny little microscopic things and why they matter. So this year my class is really into salmon. We're raising salmon for the first time and right away we've jumped into that outward facing um, public art in the school and interactive scavenger hunts and signage and posters. And um, we are looking to do the same thing we're thinking of. So we're, we did a scavenger hunt with Alevin, had them get returned. And now, right now, today we started our swim up fry hunt because we're releasing ours. And after spring break, we're going to be learning a lot more about the connection river to ocean um, and the different ecosystems that are all connected by salmon as a keystone species. And the kids are really looking forward to hopefully doing some kind of collaborative performance to share that understanding <coughs> with the wider school community, with their families. Um, and we're hoping to do a fundraiser as well and looking into maybe donating to Little Campbell Hatchery 
And again, it's about raising that awareness and empowering the kids to be those little mechanics that understand and can teach how the system works. Because so that's from just from today there, they got lots of little salmon returned. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that steaming ahead. So that, that's for our fundraiser, what we're thinking of making this year. But my dad, he's a mechanic. So he's just to bring it back to him, he's retired, but he's still a mechanic. He's still the guy I go to when I have problems with my car. And he still cares about cars. He still will tell people how to take care of their car. And he still <clears throat> takes really good care of his own car. So the hope as an educator that I have is that I can help educate little mechanics like my dad that care and that go on to continue caring even after they've sort of retired from my class, essentially. So that's my, my 10 cents. <laughs> um, the stress around it, but the tremendous, really amazing gift that it is as a learning opportunity, both as a teacher and as um, and for our students. And luckily, there is a network of folks, the Sequarian Schools Network, who kind of troubleshoot and help one another as well. But thank you so much for sharing the and the depth of what you're doing with your students is really impressive. Um, we also have with us here today, Kristen Fisher. And Kristen, we've rather impromptu strong-armed onto our panel uh, because she's a valued friend and student, I believe, of Sandra Scott as well. Were you a student? Oh, I was a student. Dr. Nashon. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Nashon. There we go. And Kristen actually also used to teach at White Rock Elementary, believe it or not. So yeah. without slide sharing, Kristen's yeah. going to share now, a few words. The camera go I'm going to try yeah. to figure that okay. out. Well, thank you. Yes, this was I'm not as prepared and a little bit more impromptu, but I am so happy to come and join. And yes, I used to teach with Yvonne. That was my very first teaching position at White Rock Elementary. Um, and I used to work at the aquarium with Sandra or Dr. Scott. And, and I uh, live and work and play on the traditional territories of the Tawasan First Nation. And um, I have always, and I've grown up there, and I um, always had a passion for the ocean. And that's, I think, what is connecting all of us, a lot of us today. And I love so much about your talk today about, um, you started out just talking about the wonder and amazement of, of our world and our natural world. And um, that is what drives us. That's what drives us to be passionate and want to protect and want to do things. Um, so I love that you started out with that because I really feel that is the core of engaging students is, is finding that, that passion. Um, is it Catherine? I'm, Laura. Laura, sorry. I just made up names now. It's been a snow. I've been teaching all day. It's a grade seven. That's what I'm going to say is I'm a grade seven teacher. It was a snow day. We'll give it that. Um, one of the contexts, I guess, of um, at, the, at around grade seven, they're very into themselves. This is a time where their their interests are about themselves and their peers. I don't know if you have teenagers, but they're just coming up to that teenager level, and um, there it's an interesting challenge to try to have them care about things other than themselves and their friends and their peers. And it is interesting to watch that development. So it, um, what I find is the most effective um, in trying to teach kids and get them excited about things is really bringing it down to finding their passions. Um, connecting to those global goals is actually one of the ways that we we try to reach forward with that. And we, so we also live very close to the ocean and being able to connect those global goals with local and practical action is a way that I've been able to kind of reconcile or put those two things together. I love Laura, the way that you pulled out like authentic real life problems and that became your, your source of inquiry and things that affected the kids on a personal level, that's where the, that's what they're gonna care about. 
um, letting their real world passions and inquiries drive your learning. I, I was so impressed by what you have accomplished. I, I was just gobsmacked that she made that look really easy, but those were many, many parts and things there that just so many things there to unpack. Um, I think the core thing that what I wanted to say is that kids will, or we all, and I've stolen this from another person and I'll tell you about that in a second, but we will protect what we love. And that is such a core of getting kids involved and getting them past, I mean, it's when I think about introducing core idea, or ideas of environmentalism and some of the challenges around like climate change and some of the pieces of our curriculum that we're trying to get kids interested in and, and knowledgeable about. Uh, what was I going to say with that one? Um, I just lost my, my train of thought. Um, one of the challenges I think, oh yeah, it was, is getting them to go a little bit deeper than just save the whales or like, they, they connect to some of the, some of their pop stars they see on TikTok and YouTube where, you know, Mr. Beast who goes out and saves a bunch of trees and they, they can kind of connect in that way and think that that's pretty cool. Um, but getting the kids to go deeper and really understand some of the, the connections and the deeper issues is, can be a challenge. But when you start with, with the things that they are connected to, and this is where we can build in elements of our place and where we come from and build in the sort of indigenous ways of knowing and respecting, connecting to our world and our place and our, um, and where we are. And for us, it's the, it's the beach. And a lot of my kids have grown up, my students have grown up on the beach and in Tawasin, you're basically surrounded by beaches. And even just, so we got connected with an organization um, called Ocean Ambassadors and a really, really neat team of people. And that was their philosophy is you will protect what you love. So it's not only about trying to go out and do some things to make a difference, but also just enjoying and engaging and recognizing the place where you are. And um, so I've learned a lot from that. And one of their initiatives is an idea around, um, she's, they've launched a, an initiative called Pick Up Three. And it's the idea that not that um, necessarily you need to organize a giant um, garbage cleanup at the, at the beach, which is also a good thing, but that we just build that into our everyday practice, that every time you're at the beach, you pick up three items and, or three things of garbage and um, just sort of building those those habits and, and it starts from that place of uh, just the, the things that you love and protect so much a part of who you are and and so for as an educator to to show those things and to really connect with those things that the kids love in their place that's that's what I, yeah, not as polished as you, Laura, but um, those are my, those are my thoughts there around, um, I guess, and that is the piece that leads them to taking on that responsibility. So thank you, everybody, for your, your thoughts today. Um, we worked together at the Aquarium so long ago, but it's like we, we, we've never left that, we, that love of the ocean keeps know, us all right? so tied it's, yeah, together. It's yeah. incredible. And of course, David, I have so many questions about those southern resident killer whales. I'm just going to have to restrain myself because Suresh is here today to give our grad student perspective and also, um, you know, your thoughts on David's presentation and the other presentation. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. So I have some slides. Oh, do you? Okay. Well, let's hook you up. <laughs> okay, Suresh. <laughs> Uh, are you on Zoom? Well, Suresh is doing that. Um, graduate student in science education yeah. here at UBC. Suresh took my uh, environmental education class. No, I did the research. Oh, the 500, but you're going to be taking my environmental ed. You're a Dutch nature science class right now. Um, so, yes, we're excited to hear what you have to say. And Suresh, where are you from? Yeah. Uh, so it's all, is it all I'm there? Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So, um, a little pause. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, somebody yeah. I wonder if there's questions. I can't really see my chat right now, but maybe uh, we have questions. Yeah. We can see them here. There are no questions right now. None? 
questions from the room? Recording in progress. So I'm one, I know I have a question for David. Oh, it's far away. Right? Should we change it from human rights? to the more than human or then like how are we going to include our whales and our you know i shouldn't say our whales uh invertebrates vertebrates if we use the term human rights just i'm putting that out there sure. yeah so um well these this rights of nature movement that i was describing is not talking about human rights it's talking about the rights of individual chimpanzees the rights of individual orangutans the rights of species to continue to exist, whether they're a tiny fish like the snail darter or a beautiful Asiatic lion, and the rights of nature writ large, like ecosystems and rivers and mountains and all of that. And those are not human rights. Those are the rights of nature. But what's really interesting, the rights of nature are currently recognized in about 15 countries around the world, whereas the human right to a healthy environment is now recognized in almost 160 nations. And the most exciting development to me is the convergence of these two things, which is happening. Latin America is in the vanguard, but in Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Bolivia, Mexico, courts are interpreting the human right to a healthy environment as having two elements, having an element of being healthy for humans, but also being healthy for ecosystems and nature, because the two can't really be separated. So in fact, it's kind of an ecological interpretation of a human right, yes. which I think is where we need to go. It's where we need to go. Wonderful. Thank you. Suresh, you're on. And I think, yes, I think in the 20 interferes, we have to the humans. Humans have the right to everything. And we interfere with it, their life is affected. Or somebody was talking about it the other day. But if you pollute a river in one area, there are people who live down the river mm -hmm. who use that river. You are interfering with their life. If you go to the Congo forest where we have the chimpanzee. If you interfere with those chimpanzees, do you find the lifestyles of those people changing? Diseases and other things. So sometimes human rights, we, we may, may not only understand them to me, just the individual humans, but I believe they are more equal. It's everything that the humans interact with is affected in the world. That, that's the direction we're headed. Just understand. Suresh. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Suresh Kinde. I'm an educator based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, so basically, in the last six months, I have heard a lot about whales and uh, oceans. <laughs> uh, and uh, that must be like more than what I have ever heard in my life before. Uh, because obviously, I was in Dr. Sandra's class. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like uh, from the country sandwich between India and China and without like connection to ocean, right? Uh, and we already have a lot to talk about on our plate. Yeah. So I just want to share a few things that we talk about in Nepal and what we're doing as an educator. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. So this is uh, Mount Chomonongna, also called Mount Everest. Right? Uh, it's like the, the highest mountain in the world, highest mountain in the world. And then uh, for everyone, like it's pretty um, obvious to assume that it's a very high mountain. So no one ever, like very few people get there. It has to be pristine and pure, right? Uh, but we just need to like change our perspective and see how, like, so this is a human, human traffic jam in the Mount Everest. And every year around 1,000 people attempt to get to the summit and uh, around 500 uh, get succeed. And some of them like just uh, live, like just give their life to the mountain, right? And some come back. Uh, but where there are humans, there are these traces. So, it's been uh, like 
something to be done. Like it's, it's at very high mountains and it's not easy to get it down uh, and it costs money and lots of things. So it's not in the priority uh, of the country, like of the third world country, right? Uh, so another thing we talk a lot about and I want to stress today uh, as well is uh, the global goals uh, and the local narratives. A lot of time we talk, uh, like we, we talk about the global goals, and even uh, in our today's presentation, we had a lot of things about the global goals and where the goals are made. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to think of uh, the local narrative, what's actually happening in the ground, right? Mm, so uh, this is uh, one. This is from 1992, and this contains the forest coverage in Nepal. Uh, so. I think it has also got a little bit of history uh, during the Cold War, uh, after the DDT was uh, during the Cold War and the, um, the invention of DDT led uh, at this part of the country, uh, the Amer Americans came with DDT to eradicate malaria. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Malay uh, and malaria and the indigenous Tharu people were living in harmony, right? But as soon as uh, the malaria was extinct, like malaria was eradicated. Everyone from uphills from, starts coming down and uh, the indigenous people were forced to like uh, give, give, give their lands, right? And at the same time, the forest declined, the forest of this belt declined very rapidly, right? Uh, so uh, although the malaria was uh, eradicated, it has to be done. But at the same time, the social and uh, uh, some call it, so some people call it like social and environmental engineering. So uh, the social and environmental engineering changed the actually changed the history of Nepal, changed a lot in Nepal. So, uh, but this was 1992, and in last three decades, 2016, uh, the uh, first coverage in Nepal has been like more than almost doubled. And this is like great news, but at the same time, uh, the, the goal is met, but at the same time, the local narrative, the, the local people think that the, the thing that, uh, that planted here are mostly non-native plants and mm -hmm. it's destroying the native ecosystem, native, native uh, wildlife and uh, even the knowledge of people. Right? So uh, this, is, uh, this is one. Uh, another thing, uh, yeah, so this is the comparison uh, that, that happened in like three decades. Uh, and another like very important goal that uh, our country made was uh, the tigers, Bengal tigers. They are like around 4,000 tigers all around the world. Uh, and then uh, in 2011 or 12, uh, the, the countries with the tigers agreed to uh, like double the number of tigers in like 12 years. Uh, and Nepal is the only country that almost tripled the number of tigers, mm -hmm. and it, it went really well. It's, it's a very successful story, uh, and we made the goal. But at the same time, only in just in 2021, uh, in the span of like 11 months, 12 people got killed by the tiger, the, the, the same tiger that like increased their number. Uh, so um, I think the as uh, we made our goals, what kind of implication it's making uh, to the local people and uh, local surrounding has to be thought, right? Uh, so this is what we talk about uh, in uh, like uh, lots of our uh, classes and in, in, in any events, right? So uh, just to add what we do uh, as an educator, what we do in the classes, uh, in 2012, um, I have a, I with a couple of my friends co-founded uh, education organization Karkana. Uh, so, uh, the, like since the inception, uh, we uh, we are focused on sustainability and climate adaptation. Uh, adaptation. Uh, and the important thing that we want to uh, highlight in that is the local narrative. So, how we address the local narrative while we meet the uh, like global goals, like sustainable development goals, right? So here the students are uh, playing with sustainable development goal cards. Uh, and then, uh, so they are, they, are, they are coming up with uh, the ideas to solve 
uh, to reach the development goals. But again, at the same time, thinking about how that will affect their own community and their own life. And this is what we're doing right now. Like this is, uh, I, I asked my uh, friends to uh, get the photos uh, just yesterday. So uh, e-waste has been an emerging problem in Kathmandu, the, the, the city, it, it's a city-based program. So emerging problem in Kathmandu. And we're trying to address it uh, before uh, it becomes like a really huge problem to, to get addressed. So uh, with the students, uh, we're just exploring what e-waste is. And generally um, by e-waste, uh, like uh, here are the examples, right? The computers, mobiles, and lots of these things are like a black box and uh, people do not like um, comfortably cannot uh, use that or like, use that or repair that and um, uh, and the com comfortably they, can, they don't want to open it, right? So what we're doing is uh, we're partnering with uh, the recycling uh, recycling experts and other, other educators uh, and uh, trying to see how we can reuse or recycle uh, the things that that's like broken in our home, right? And uh, but I've been hearing like amazing stories, uh, like students came to the plant, came to the class with the broken materials and then they repair the water heaters and then power blocks um, uh, and, and things like smaller things like that. So that's, that's very amazing to see. And uh, I think um, more than uh, breaking it and repairing it, uh, we want it to be like, glorious, right? So repair or like reuse is a glorious thing. It's not just like, it's not, it's not just like random thing that uh, uh, repair is off or like someone, someone do, right? So well, we're trying to make it glorious work uh, and uh, so that uh, maybe like that's, uh, that will, we'll, we'll see the result like when they are uh, on the position to uh, like decide, right? So. I just want to close uh, with uh, this uh, saying from uh, Dr. Robert Sun. Uh, so uh, it's like definitely uh, it's important to look at the ideas or like bigger ideas of the project. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to think how local residents, local people are developing the narrative after that. Thank you.